Good morning. Thank you, Ellie. That was beautiful. Good to have you out this morning. We had a great time at the men's banquet last night. Alinda and the team did an amazing job, really, truly did. So we we're so glad for that. Uh, we're also praising God that Larry Staggers is home. He thanks you for your prayers. Every day he gets better. So let's keep praying for him. Uh, Barb Pearson is on her way home too, and she's recovering. So this is good. Today it's Pastor John Bowman from down south. You might pick up on a little southern accent. He's not new to us. He's a great friend of our ministry, great personal friend of mine. So would you welcome Pastor John Bowman this morning? All right. Good morning. Good to see you today, and I appreciate so much you being here. I'll do something a little different today, if I can. Uh, I'm going to have you turn to two different places. So if you can go to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. I'm having you there for a reason. I'm going to use that as a segue uh, this morning. And again, thank you all so much for having me. I'm always just thrilled uh, to come up here and to be able to preach. These are different times, and uh, I don't know. Um, I remember the very first, when this pandemic first started, uh, I remember the first time I went to the grocery store and wore a mask. And, and it just felt so weird, you know, in the United States of America to have a mask on. And it's amazing how that now, everywhere you go, everybody's got one on, and it doesn't feel so strange anymore. However, I am going to be glad when we don't have to wear them anymore. Anybody with me on that? I didn't realize how bad my breath stunk until I started wearing that mask, you know, and now I'm using mouthwash more often. But uh, uh, I'm just praising God, you know, that even in a pandemic, He is still God. Somebody say amen. Uh, more than that. So, uh, more people than that say amen. amen. All right. All right. That's a whole lot better. We're in uh, Genesis chapter 6, but we're going to be in Revelation chapter 15 first. And I want to do this. In Revelation 15, something very interesting appears before John's eyes. You know, John is writing, John the Apostle, he's writing the book of Revelation and somewhere around A.D. 90 in the 90s in the first century. And, and, and it's not just interesting, it's initially confusing. As you read Revelation 15, to set the backdrop, the term revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. You know, a lot of times you hear the term apocalyptic and you think, oh, that's something horrible. And, and we do use it, you know, it kind of carries a bad connotation. But apocalyptic actually comes from the word apocalypsis, which is where we get our word revelation. And the word revelation simply means the unveiling. And it's really the unveiling of Jesus. And it's this, the unveiling of Jesus to recapture this earth. And of course, you know, now we kind of ask the question, does, does, is, is, does, G, does God own the earth? Well, sure he does. But right now we understand that there, because of Adam's sin, uh, Adam kind of gave dominion over to Satan himself. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says the God of this world, little g, talking about Satan himself. So what's going to happen is this. We understand right now that God is sovereign, but there's a lot of bad stuff going on. And God is going to recapture this whole thing through this, these events that we see in Revelation. But as we look at the unveiling of Jesus Christ, what we see is that we see that this plan includes a, a, a seven-sealed scroll. We are introduced to that in Revelation chapter 5, and we see how that only Jesus is worthy to open that scroll. But it serves as the title deed to this earth. And within this scroll are seven seals, seven trumpet, and seven vial or seven bowl judgments that eventually secure and finish God's wrath on this earth toward all of his enemies. So in Revelation 15, the context text here is in rapid fire motion and it portrays the very last judgments. It's the last seven judgments before Jesus returns in Revelation 19 and he of course fights the battle of Armageddon. But in Revelation 15 in rapid fire motion Here's what John is doing. John has given us these last seven judgments as these, these last bowl or vile judgments. And John uses the word eschatos. So, you know, sometimes you'll hear a preacher talk about eschatology. What is eschatology? What's the study of last things? And so in Revelation 1, you'll pick up on this. John uses that word. Look at Revelation 15. Look at verse 1. John says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last, there it is, eschatos, the last plagues. These are the very last judgments. The last, that's where we're getting our word eschatos, eschatology. The last plagues, for in them the, uh, uh, the wrath of God, our Bible says, is complete. Now, here, here's the picture. Seven angels emerge from heaven, our Bible says. Each one with his own bowl or his own vial. It's a, it's a particular judgment of God's wrath to dump on the earth. Each bowl contains something different, but they are all cataclysmic. They are all catastrophic in nature. 
They're devastating. Look, if you will, at verse 5. After these things, I looked, and behold, a temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls or vials full of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. You know, something that's very interesting uh, the thing that I find the most interesting anyway is the source. Did you notice where these angels are coming from? Now, these are the angels, the last seven angels carrying the last seven bowls or the vials. These are the final judgments of God before Jesus comes back. And yet, what, what, what I guess fascinates me here and even baffles me is the source of these angels. Because our Bible tells us that they emerge from where? From the temple. The temple, what does the temple represent? Well, our temple, uh, the temple always has represented God's holiness. It has always represented uh, God's mercy. And yet right here what we see is we see that God's judgment is directly rooted into his holiness and into his mercy. Sometimes we get this idea. We think, you know, sometimes that God's judgment is a suspension of his holiness. And we think sometimes that God's judgment is a suspension of his mercy. But ladies and gentlemen, God's judgment is directly rooted and it's directly connected to his holiness and to his mercy. Now, the reason that I'm bringing this out is because right here in our world, you're going to get asked this question at some point. I get asked this question all the time. People are looking through the Old Testament and they're reading about what God did in the Old Testament. And then they're looking in Revelation and they're looking at what God has, is going to do in Revelation. And the idea that they get if they're lost or if they just don't understand their Bible, is that they think that God is associated with being unmerciful and that God is associated with just wrath and that he's just a mean, murderous God and that he doesn't really care about anybody because how in the world could God care about anybody if he's doing all of these things in the Old Testament and then he's doing, going to do these things in Revelation, how in the world can God actually care about people? Now, let's, let's look at Revelation just briefly and then we'll go to Genesis 6 because let's find God's mercy. To be clear, these seven bold judgments, before them, what has God done? God, before this, has sent two witnesses in the spirit of Moses and Elijah to preach for three and a half years. Then in the second three and a half years of tribulation, he sends 144,000 sealed Jewish missionaries throughout all of the earth. They're sealed. The Antichrist can't touch them. And then in Revelation 14, here's what he does. He sends an angel that preaches the gospel throughout all the world. Now, let's talk about this for a second. Before these bold judgments, now, of course, there's the seals, and then the seventh seal is, of course, the trumpet judgments, and then the seventh trumpet opens up the seven bowls of the seven vials, which ushers in the battle of Armageddon. But before this happens, what has God done? Has God demonstrated mercy? Yes, because this is the characteristic of God, maybe one of the ones that I love the most. Before he sends judgment, he always sends mercy. Before he sends judgment, he always extends his mercy. How much more mercy could he extend than to have two witnesses in the spirit of Moses and Elijah working wonders, preaching the gospel in the first three and a half years? How much more mercy could he have than having 144,000 Jewish missionaries, 12,000 from every tribe that's preaching during the second three and a half years? And then just to make sure that everybody has heard, he sends an angel in Revelation 14 to preach the gospel so that everybody has had an opportunity. God, before he sends judgment, he sends mercy. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. That's an act of mercy. God allowed the people of Jericho. Do you remember how Rahab talked about how that they knew about the, the parting of the Red Sea? That was 40 years before the two spies came to visit Rahab. And she says, we've heard about this. That's why Rahab herself wanted to become an Old Testament believer. She had heard about what had happened with the, at the Red Sea. She had heard about what happened in Exodus. She had heard about what happened with the kings. She understood that God is all-powerful. Do you remember what God did before he sent Nebuchadnezzar in in, in 605 B.C. in the Babylonian captivity? He sends Jeremiah, and he tells Jeremiah, you preach the truth. And I suppose most significantly, in the case of Noah. Turn to Genesis 6, if you would. Genesis 6, because I want to clarify something. It may be helpful to you. It may be helpful uh, to you. It may help you personally. I hope it does, but it, it, I, it's for sure going to help you as you deal with other people, because we understand this. We understand 
from Genesis chapter 6 that Noah himself, who is Noah? He's a descendant of Seth. I was asked the question some time ago. Some guy asked me this, and, and, and it was a good question. He said, Pastor John, he said, how many descendants of Cain do you think are on the earth? I said, none. He said, what do you mean none? He said, how could there not be any? I said, because there was a worldwide flood. Noah was a descendant of Seth. There's no descendants of Cain. Everybody's a descendant of Seth at this point. The Bible is the story of Seth and his lineage, and we are all from Seth. And, of course, we're all from Noah as well, who is from Seth. So uh, uh, somebody was talking about, you know, somebody, that guy must be a descendant of Cain. He can't be because there are no descendants of Cain anymore. We are all descendants of Seth. So that just clarifies a little bit. But watch this in Genesis chapter 6 because this is where I want to make my biggest, I guess, point today. The Bible says in verse number 1, Now it came to pass when men began, began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for them, themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. Watch this. For he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they, were bo they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I I have made them, but watch this in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm not going to read on any further, but as you read on, you'll find out that God informs Noah that his, about his coming judgment. He actually instructs Noah on how to prepare the ark, how many animals of each kind to take on the ark, and I'm a bit fascinated with the biblical numerics of this. Uh, you know, I've probably preached here before on biblical numerics, and you know, today I want to focus on, on a number, this number eight this number eight, because you will find this number. Of course, you're going to find the number 40 in, in this passage as well, 40 days and 40 nights as you read on, and that's the number of testing and trial. It also stands out, but I just want to focus on this number eight just for a moment, and I'll tell you why. Eight is the number of restored life. In the Bible, if you see the term, the word eight, most of the time it's talking about restored life, and it's talking about regeneration. It's the number of God bringing new life to a dead situation. Now think about this for a second. Other than the resurrected Jesus and the saints that arose at the resurrection, as we read in Matthew, but other than that, there are eight episodes of restored life in Scripture. There are eight. You say, well, where are they? Well, you remember Elijah raised one, and then Elisha, he raised one during his life, and then after his life, you remember the man was thrown on his dead bones, and he actually raised a guy from the dead after he was even dead. That's pretty remarkable. Peter raised one. Paul raised one, Jesus raised three. When you add them up, what do you have? You have eight. Now here in Genesis 6, the condition of the earth is spiritually dead. We'll talk about it in a minute. But other than Noah, apparently, and his family, our Bible says the thoughts of men's hearts were only wicked continually. Now, God wants to bring new life to a spiritually dead situation. And how many people does he use to do it? Well, you have Noah and his wife. You have his three sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. You have eight. You have eight souls that God is going to use to bring life to a dead situation. God has a purpose to regenerate, but he also has a purpose to warn before the judgment. And this is the beauty, and this is what I want to really bring out. We look at the flood, and our world out here, our culture, they look at the worldwide flood, and most people don't even believe in it. But the ones that maybe possibly do are wondering how in the world that God could be so cruel and how God could be so hateful and so wrathful and so murderous and so violent that he would do something so terrible as, th as this. And yet we have to look at the full scope of God's existence. We have to look at his every trait because he is infinite in his every, every trait. He is infinite in his every characteristic. First of all, let's notice this. The obvious fact, God said in Genesis 3, watch, look back at Genesis chapter, excuse me, Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 3. Look what our Bible says. The Bible says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. For what? My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Now, this is what he said. Yet his days shall be 120 years. You know, you'll pick up several commentaries on that particular verse, and you'll get all kinds of ideas as to what God is talking about right there. 
And, and some commentators will even say that, that, that God is just speaking there, Moses as he is writing, and he's saying that man generally lives for 120 years. That is not what God is saying there. That's not what Moses is writing. You say, how do you know that? Well, Noah lived to be 950 years old. You got Methuselah who lived to be 969 years old. People lived a whole lot longer than 120 years. And so as you read this, God is saying something totally different. What God is saying is God is referring to the days that are left before the flood. 120 years. Now, if you look at Noah and his three sons and all the work they had to do, uh, it would take them 120 years to build an ark of this size. I mean, the building of the ark is just a, a mammoth of a responsibility. And so God is saying here in Genesis 6, through the pen of Moses, there's 120 years before he's going to send the flood. Now, here's the big question. Did Noah preach during those 120 years? Well, as you go back in Genesis, there's no record that Noah ever preached the sermon at all. None. As you're reading through your Old Testament... Noah's 120 years building this ark. Did he ever preach one message? Well, the Old Testament doesn't tell us that he did. However, if you go over to your New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. You know what preachers of righteousness do? They preach. And so what do you think Noah was doing for 120 years? Was he working on the ark? Absolutely. But what else was he doing? He was preaching. And what is this a sign of? This is a sign of God's mercy. The whole world, think about what the Bible has described the world as being. It's not just that their actions are evil continually. It's that even their thoughts, their motives, everything about these people all over the world. We're not talking about just a nationality here. We're talking about the whole human race, other than Noah and his family, those he had direct influence over. Our Bible tells us that every person, that every thought, every action was only evil continually. Anybody here take the Bible literally? I do. I take the Bible literally. When the, <laughs> I saw you, Mark. <laughs> I take the Bible literally. Literally meaning, if the Bible says every person, every thought, every intent was only evil continually, what I believe is that it's every thought and every intent and every motive from every person is only evil continually. And so this is a very wicked situation. The Bible doesn't just say that every thought was evil. It was even the intents of their heart, every action. And listen, when a society becomes like this, when a society descends to this kind of condition, inevitably, here's what's going to happen. And this is the crux, this is the very crux of God's action. When a society gets to a point where every person and every thought, every motive, every action is only evil continually, that society is very soon to self-destruct. That society will self-destruct. You say, how does that happen? Well, sooner or later, everybody becomes murderous. Sexually transmitted diseases, suicide, self-destruction. You can go all across the board there, and this is what God is seeing. So if that re occurs, remember Genesis 3.15? God made a promise. The first mention of the gospel, God made a promise. That promise is that he is going to send a seed of the woman that he is going to have his heel bruised, but he is going to crush the head of Satan. Now, here's the problem. If society continues going as it's going in Genesis 6, they're going to self-destruct, and there are ramifications to that. You say, what are the ramifications of that? Well, here's ultimately, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but listen, it, it, who, is, who is going to be the seed of the woman? The seed of the woman... It's Jesus, and ultimately, it's going to be Christ. It's the first mention of the gospel. And so as we look at this, what we have to understand is what God is doing through this flood is he is being unmercifully merciful. And I know that sounds like a paradox, and it kind of is, but he is being unmercifully merciful. First of all, he is merciful. Who's he merciful to? Well, he's merciful to the population. Think about God's mercy in this situation. Number one, he's merciful to the population because he gives them 120 years to turn their hearts back to him, and he gives them a preacher of righteousness in this person of Noah. Second, he is merciful to Noah and his family. He's, he's allowing them to build this ark that's going to ultimately save the human race. Third, he's merciful to the animals. I know that sounds silly, but he's, he's salvaging uh, the animals, their existence. And last but not least, he's being merciful. Think about this. 
He's being merciful to the people for the last 2,000 years who have died trusting him. You say, Pastor John, how does that make any sense? Well, here's the thing. If, if God allows the human race to continue as they are, they're going to self-destruct. If they self-destruct, there'll be no human race. If there's no human race, there's no seed of the woman. If there's no seed of the woman, there's no Messiah. If there's no Messiah, there's no atonement for sin. If there's no atonement for sin, every person that has died before the flood, trusting God, dies, and they go to where? Hell! Hell! Do you see the mercy of God here? Number one, to the people that are alive. We've got 120 years. Listen to the preacher of righteousness. Number two, Noah, I'm, you're, I'm allowing you 120 years to build an ark. Animals, I'm salvaging you two by two in Psalm 7. You're coming on the ark. And then to the people, many of which have died, if God allows things to keep going, See, the world out here would say God is just not, he's just a mean God. He's not a mean God. He's given everybody opportunity to be saved during that 120 years. Everybody. They hear, they're hearing the preaching. Well, what about Noah? Noah's, Noah's building an ark. God's going to use him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. If God allows things to keep, if God, let me, how about I just ask this question? What if God had not sent the flood? We say, well, God sent the flood, so he's unmerciful. What if God had not sent the flood? Human race is extinct. The line of Seth, the line of Adam and Eve, the line of Seth is extinct. And everybody up until that point has died and they have gone to hell. God is a God of mercy. And he's even a God of mercy in sending the flood. When you look at the whole picture, when you look at the panoramic picture of what God is doing, God is sending mercy. Just the act of sending the flood preserved the human race, preserved the messianic line so that Jesus could come and Jesus could die on a cross and Jesus could be our Savior. And not just ours, but every person that has ever trusted God throughout the Old Testament. In actuality, when Jesus was on the cross, God the Father showed Jesus no mercy. No mercy. Jesus absorbed the full physical punishment of the cross, and more so, he drank the full wrath of God spiritually. Physically, he absorbed the full weight of the cross. But more so and more importantly for us, spiritually, our Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our Bible tells us in the New Testament that he who knew no sin became our sin that we might become the righteousness of God. In order for that to take place, God could show Jesus no mercy. But in showing Jesus no mercy, he showed us plenty of mercy. Sometimes when it looks like that God is being mean, He's really being merciful. Our Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, 10, that it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. How in the world can it possibly please the Lord to bruise Jesus? Because in the bruising of Jesus is the redemption of you and of me. And so as we look at this, please, our, our world will come to us and they will say this and they believe this. Says, Your God is a God of bloodshed. Your God is a God of massacre. Your God is a God of murder. And you be reminded of this. Even when they bring up the flood, God was merciful. 120 years of preaching, merciful. Animals preserved, merciful. Noah, a descendant of Seth, preserved, merciful. Noah has three sons. One of them's name is Shem. As you follow Shem's line, you can follow Shem's line to David. You can follow David to Solomon, David to Nathan. Follow Solomon to Matthew 1. Follow Nathan to Luke chapter 3. You'll see Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, in Matthew 1. That's his lineage. You'll see Mary's lineage in Luke chapter 3. You can follow the line from Seth all the way to Jesus Christ himself. But in the midst of that, there had to be a worldwide flood. And in annihilating all of those people, you say, well, I just, God, wow, it's just so mean. Well, they had, they had their opportunity. It's just like in Revelation 15. We look at Revelation 15 the same way we look at Genesis chapter 6. 
Revelation 15. Oh, God is so mean. God is going to wipe out all of these people. Well, they've had so much time. They've had witnesses. They've had 144,000 witnesses. They've had an angel. They have made their choice, and they're not going to change their minds. And at that point, God has no choice but to take them out. And in Genesis chapter 6, the same is true. God gave them 120 years, and then 120 years, they didn't want anything to do with them. He has no choice but to wipe them out because in not wiping them out, he wipes out the lineage of the Messiah. And so today, don't ever let people tell you, oh, well, our God is not merciful. He is merciful. He is a merciful God. One of the most, uh, I guess, staggering things that, that I read in my, in my Bible is when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays a very, I don't know, uh, when I first read it, it, just, it's, it, it was disturbing to me because he prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, if there's any way for this cup. Now, the cup, when Jesus says that, the cup is the wrath of God. And Jesus says, is there any, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, that means that Jesus, he really wanted to bypass the cross. He had a strong desire not to go to the cross. Jesus was, in his humanity, looking at the physical torture that he's going to go through. He doesn't want to go through that. Who would? But even more so, Jesus could see things we can't see. It's the spiritual torture that he's going to go through. When he became, what, what happened when Jesus hung on the cross? This is what happened. He who knew no sin became sin. That means literally Jesus became sin, not a sinner. That's different. That's different. Not a sinner, but he became sin. Sin personified. So that when Jesus died, the power of sin died along with him. When he said to tell us die, it is finished. What he was saying is he is saying, I have put sin to death once and for all. It is finished. He had absorbed the full wrath. And Jesus in the garden, through prophetic eyes, he sees what he's going to have to go through for that. Not just the six hours, but the stuff that went on even before that. But then he says this. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Now, what that tells me is this. Did Jesus have a strong desire to bypass the cross? Yes, he did. But he had a stronger desire to save us. A stronger desire. And so, Jesus, he absorbed the full wrath of God. And God was unmerciful to Jesus. And in some people's eyes, he was just downright cruel to Jesus. And yet, through Christian eyes, we understand it's what had to happen. And so, in that case, was God being a mean God? No, because ultimately, he was sacrificing Jesus for the salvation of every person. As far as Noah goes, I stress this to you. I mentioned to the men last night, and actually I think I'll use Noah as, a, as an example. One thing about Noah was this. Noah was willing to look foolish for the glory of God. And as we move forward, I shared with our men last night, and this time is coming, our culture is designing it to where Christianity is going to be made to look foolish. It already is. They already make fun of you and already make fun of me because we believe there's a God. They already make fun of us because we don't buy into the science of spontaneous generation and evolution. They already look at us. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, it, 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 isn't it interesting to you how that they will call science out when it works to their favor, but then uh, they ignore science when it doesn't? For example, scientifically, when does life begin? Conception, right? Uh, by definition, what is murder? The taking of an innocent life. Now, if you're going to follow science, be consistent with it. Scientifically, any time a little baby is killed in his mother's womb or her mother's womb, that little baby has been murdered. And yet the world out there says, well, you're crazy for believing that. That's just science. I just remind you of this. The sci science means to know. Science means to know. And ladies and gentlemen, today, we can know. We know. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. Today, there is a God, and He's not a God. He's the God. 
He is the God. There is a Savior. He's not a Savior. He is the Savior. And the worldwide flood, why did God bring it? To preserve the line so that we could be saved. And all God's people very silently said, Amen. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, that we can understand your mercy to a degree. God, as our world looks on and as they misrepresent you and as they speak of you as though you're just a, a mean and murderous and bloodletting God, God, would you remind us of how merciful that you are and that you're being even now. God, you were merciful for 120 years. God, you gave people an opportunity to turn to you, and they refused to. And Lord, you had no choice. God, there's a day coming when you'll have no choice again. We read Revelation 15. God, how the angels ascend or descend, Lord, from your place of holiness and justice and mercy. And yet, Lord, you have no choice. At that point, Lord, they will have had opportunity. And Lord, thank you right now that we have opportunity. There may be somebody that's listening right now that, Lord, they don't know you as Savior. Lord, would you save them today? And God, would you remind us all of how good that you are, how merciful and how gracious that you are, and, and how good that you have been. And Lord, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you. We love you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you all so much for being here. I don't know what your protocol is as far as dismissal. I'm assuming you're dismissed, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. God bless you. You are dismissed.